also, dear colleagues, welcome to the Head of Physics and Space Show Physics Seminars promoted by the Brazilian National Institute for Space Research and the Galileo Solar Space Telescope Working Groups. In particular, this seminar is hosted by the Space Show Physics Postgraduate Program and by the Research in Heliophysics Project, sponsored by CAPS, a Brazilian funding agency. Our guest today is Dr. Nicholas Featherstone from the Space Science and Engineering Division at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Dr. Featherstone research centers around the dynamo problem with emphasis on understanding how convective flows generated and sustained a uh, magnetic field in rotating astrophysical bodies. He is engaged in projects that involve numerical models and often entails the use of 3D MHD convection codes that run on supercomputers. These projects have involved the study of quark convection in massive stars, the geodynamo, the solar dynamo, and the gas giant integers. Nick is also the developer of the Halley Convection Code, an open source community in MHD Convection Code. Halley Code is now serving as a central component in numerical convection studies being carried out by Nick and in collaboration with colleagues from US, Canada, and Europe. He served also as mentor of a graduate and other graduate students and current he is the mentor of several postdocs. So Nikki, on behalf of INPI, we would like to thank you very much for accepting our invitation to present this seminar on the large scale dynamics of the solar convection zone, which is of course a topic of central interest of our research activities. We just ask the audience to mute their microphones during the presentation. After the talk, or you can ask questions or write them down at the chat. So please go ahead. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to speak. Um, and uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm Nick Featherstone. I'm at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the uh, Applied Math Department at the University of Colorado. Um, and I'll be talking um, really about convection in the sun and not so much about magnetism. Um, and this is kind of what my uh, research group and collaborators, uh, most of whom are, are, are actually over at the University of Colorado, uh, focus on these days. And so I, I, I do a lot of work uh, in particular with uh, Brad Heinemann and uh, then two postdocs that work with us, Lydia Corey and Maria Kamisasa. Um, but uh, some of these ideas uh, were uh, kind of worked on in collaboration with uh, Keith Julian and John Arnaud. Uh, John Arnaud is at UCLA, uh, Mike Calkins, who's at CU, Jeff Vassell at uh, Sydney, and I've, I've worked with Mark Meesh, who maybe some of you have uh, met at some point in the past, uh, who's at UCAR, um, and uh, he's actually about to move back into research, so that's that's a good thing. Um, let me see. Hang on a second, my slides are not moving. There we go. Uh, so just kind of a, a, a brief outline. Uh, what I'll talk about first is this, this question of um, convective amplitudes uh, in the sun, really how, how fast is the, is the characteristic speed of deep solar convection um, and what is its spatial scale? Um, and that's sort of the, the topic that's on our minds uh, lately. Um, and that's kind of the motivation. Then I'll talk a little bit about how we actually mod model rotating stellar convection. Um, and then some some future directions that we're we're heading in after I talk about some of our, our results from the past few years. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things you know that's interesting about the sun, right, is that people have been observing it since long before there was ever a theory of electromagnetism. Right, um, Galileo, in particular, made some detailed uh, observations uh, as far back as the 1600s. Uh, where he was actually mapping sunspots on the surface of the sun. Uh, and if you take these observations from day to day, uh, you can actually animate them and see the rotation of the sun and see the evolution of some of these, these active regions that he was, he was able to see. Um, and of course, we know now that uh, these, these big spots on the sun are where a magnetic field um, you know, sort of pokes through the surface. 
um, and the, the region there in the photosphere is a little bit cooler, a little bit darker uh, as a result. If we watch these uh, these areas on the sun evolve over time, we see that there's there's a lot of patterns um, and ordering to them, both uh, in space and in time. Um, we know that the the sun has this uh, 22 year uh, polarity cycle, and the the number of sunspots increases and then decreases over that cycle with kind of an 11 year semi period. Uh, we know these things appear uh, at mid latitudes and, and migrate toward the equator and they exhibit other rules like uh, you know, Hell's polarity law and Joy's law uh, for the tilt of the, the, the leading and uh, trailing regions. And you know, really the big question is where does all this uh, magnetism come from? Um, can we explain it? Can we predict uh, the strength of, of the next cycle? Um, and to do that, we really need to know something about what's going on deeper inside the sun. Um, and, you know, it's interesting when we look at these, these really nice pictures from, say, AIA uh, or Hinode uh, of the, the surface of the sun, we're, we're bombarded with so much information. Uh, but if you were to sort of draw a, a, an onion shell diagram of the sun, this, this area we see, the photosphere, right, it's, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it's this, this very, very tiny region. Um, and if we just consider this region where this photospheric granulation uh, is is occurring. So the small scale convective, um, these small scale convective features we see on the surface of the sun, that's like you know a megameter, so a thousand kilometers uh, deep, and even across that relatively small region of the sun, the temperature and the density vary uh, quite drastically. Uh, but we can't see inside. But this granulation uh, allows us to do that, right? So um, this uh, small scale convection is going off. Um, all the time, you know, it lasts for something uh, like a few minutes at a time. It occurs over a, a, a scale of a thousand kilometers, give or take, and it does so pretty much stochastically. Um, and so what's happening, of course, is we know that um, this warm plasma is rising to the surface and it emits light, and then it cools and you form a little downflow plume. Uh, but the nice thing, right, when that happens, um, which is almost magic in some ways, is that it generates sound waves. And so what we have is this really nice uh, stochastic source of sound waves um, that then propagate through what is really a, a resonant cavity, right? So the, 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 the whole sun is, is, is a resonant cavity and there's, there's lots of different resonant modes that can be excited that have very high Q values. Um, and so if we, we look at the surface of the sun and if we were to, to, to measure its motion toward or away from us, right, its Doppler uh, shift um, along the line of sight, uh, we can actually see these waves um, interfering with each other traveling across the surface of the sun. And if we take um, a power spectrum in space and time uh, of, of the solar surface, we, we can um, see very well-defined ridges um, <clears throat> excuse me, very well-defined uh, ridges of power that are associated with these different resonant modes. And these, these resonant modes allow us to probe uh, the interior of the sun using what we call helioseismology that is very much analogous to uh, seismology on the earth. And there's, there's been a lot of results from helioseismology, uh, but probably the two big ones to come out of global helioseismology when we look at uh, modes that, that actually exist all over the sphere, the spherical surface of the sun. Um, we know the, the structure of the sun now. We know that the, the outer one third um, is unstable to convection. And below that, we believe it's stable to convection and uh, light just, just scatters freely throughout this, this zone. Um, but once, we, once it reaches the convection zone, um, it doesn't scatter as freely, and the, the, these large-scale convective motions are what's required to help carry that heat to the surface where it can ultimately radiate as the, the photons that we observe. Um, and we think this convection zone is probably home to the dynamo. Um, we think there or at its base is probably where the magnetic field uh, that we observe at the surface of the sun is generated. This isn't known for sure, uh, but this is, this is what, what most of us think, I believe. Um, 
And so if we want to know something about it, what we would really like to know is what, what does the, the convection look like? And can we use uh, our knowledge of the interior convection to say something about the, the generation of magnetic field? Um, the other big result uh, that comes out of global heliosseismology, which also gives us some clues to what the convection uh, may be doing, uh, is that we know that the convection zone rotates differentially. And so uh, the equator rotates with a period of something like 24 days, whereas the polar regions take about a month to rotate. Um, of course, the mean rotation rate of the sun is somewhere around, mean rotation period is somewhere around 27 days. And so we, we know there's this big region of convection, and then we know that convection drives this differential rotation, which gives us some clues to how fast it is and what the structure might be. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so when we ask uh, what is the, the structure of interior solar convection, there's kind of a related question, uh, which is what is the, the effective Rossby number of the sun? And so this is just a, a non-dimensional number. You can define this uh, in different ways, but they all have sort of the same flavor. Um, and it's basically the rotation, excuse me, it's basically the ratio of a, of a rotational time scale to a convective time scale. And so if you're rotating really rapidly, um, you tend to have a, a low Rossby number um, unless your convection is also very rapid. And if you, you're rotating slowly but have, have rapid convection, you have a, have a high Rossby number. So it's, it's sort of telling you um, the, uh, the ratio of these, these different time scales, however you choose to, de to, to define them, particularly the convective time scale, people define that differently. Um, but the low Rossby number means slow convection relative to the, to the rotation rate. Um, and where the sun sits on, on the spectrum of possibilities for the Rossby number um, is probably going to tell us uh, something important about the, the solar dynamo. Um, and so to get a sense of why this matters, um, there are all kinds of different uh, possibilities uh, for what the convection may look like, but they probably on some level have this columnar aspect to them. Now the, the solar convection zone is, is, a, is a very turbulent uh, region, and there, there's convection taking place across all different scales. Um, but we expect there to be some uh, degree of coherent vortices, you can think of it, um, in the convection zone, uh, if the convection is actually influenced by rotation. And you can think about this um, just by considering the Coriolis force. So that's just the, the rotation vector uh, crossed with the, the, the velocity vector. Um, but this really looks like QV cross B, right? This looks like the Lorentz force. And so just like you can define a gyro radius uh, for the Lorentz force, you can do that as well uh, for, for the Coriolis force. And what you see is that this radius um, basically looks like uh, the system depth. So you can think of it as the depth of the, the convective layer times this, this Rossby number. Um, so you just sort of multiply and, and divide by L for your gyro radius and you come out with this expression. And so the idea is that when the, when the Rossby number is high, um, your Coriolis force is really weak and your convection is, is not really going to have any coherent structure to it. It's going to sort of take place across all available uh, spatial scales that are, when it's really just determined by the, the size of your convective layer. But when your Rossby number is low, and your Coriolis forces are, are strong relative to, to other forces in the system like the buoyant driving or the uh, inertia associated with the, the downflowing plumes, um, you tend to get much uh, narrower um, vortices that, that will develop in the flow. And of course, these are occurring in the midst of a much more complicated flow. They're not gonna look like these big coherent plastic telephone poles, um, but you know, this is schematically what we, what we kind of expect. And I'll just say this isn't just uh, theory, uh, this is seen in the laboratory. Um, and so this is uh, showing some different rotating uh, tanks of convection uh, at UCLA. Uh, this is from a paper by John Chang, who was a graduate student at the time of John Arnaud. Um, and the idea is you heat these tanks from below, and they're spinning uh, kind of about the long axis and you, you cool them from above. Um, and so when you're not rotating, uh, which is on the right here, uh, your turbulence is basically just fully 3D and all over the place. Um, and as you increase the rotation rate of the tank moving from right to left, 
um, you see that the the structures and the and the um, fluid that are being imaged here are uh, becoming more and more coherent. They tend to span the full um, extent of the tank, um, and they become thinner and thinner as you rotate more rapidly. Okay, so something like this is what we 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 expect to be happening in the sun, but we're kind of not sure where it sits on this, this spectrum. And of course, all of this matters uh, for the dynamo when we think about the, the MHD induction equation, right? And so we can break this into its different pieces, but the, the piece for the dynamo that um, probably matters the most is this, this shear production, this B dot grad V piece. And there's kind of two ways we get shear in a, in a big rotating a spherical system like this. One is on the large scales um, through differential rotation, right? So we know that the, the, the phi component of the velocity, the, the longitudinal component of the velocity very strongly in latitude. And so that can give us a really strong grad V. Uh, but also uh, we can have shear uh, that's organized and coherent on small scales just due to the fact that as we move across uh, this, this range of possibilities and move towards these, these smaller uh, convective columns, they also have quite a bit of helicity associated with them. And so that can give you uh, an, an alpha effect. So uh, small scale nonlinear generation of the magnetic field. Uh, this is just another diagram. There's a nice paper here from a review by, a nice image here reviewed by Peter Olson from some time ago. Um, but the, the idea is that you can take these, these little helical rolls and if you thread them with field running uh, right to left, so with toroidal field, uh, they will very readily generate poloidal field. Um, and similarly, if you thread them with field running up and down, so poloidal field, you can think of this as sort of north-south kind of magnetic field, um, they also have a tendency to generate east-west field. And so this this sort of fundamental uh, uh, component of the convection, this convective column, this roll, uh, you may hear them called busa columns, banana cells, Taylor columns, these are all the same thing. Um, this is probably playing, or it could be playing quite an active role in the generation of magnetic field in the sun, uh, also in the other planets like in the earth or in Jupiter, um, Uranus or Saturn. Uh, and one thing we know about uh, this, this uh, kind of organized convective structure, it's, it's a really good way of generating a differential rotation. And so the fact that the, the convection tends to spin up into these vortices um, is also, uh, we think, probably the reason that the sun has uh, a, a fast equator and slow poles like it does. And of course, this, uh, this differential rotation then serves as a source of a mega effect and so it's a way for us to wind north-south field into east-west field on very large, large scales. Uh, now, depending uh, where we are uh, in this, this Rossby number uh, kind of uh, parameter space, we can get very different forms of differentiation in a, in a rotating system, uh, convecting system like the sun. Uh, and also we can get different forms for the meridional uh, circulation. And so what you're seeing here, is kind of a range of different possible differential uh, rotation profiles on the top. And moving from left to right, we're moving from a, a really rapidly rotating or a really slowly convecting regime to the opposite, to a slowly rotating or rapidly convecting regime. So we're moving from low Rossby number to high Rossby number. Um, and what we see is that um, as we move to high enough Rossby number, we can actually flip the sense of the differential rotation. And so we can have a, a rapid polar region, which is um, indicated by the red here, uh, and, a, and a slow uh, equatorial region. Um, and we know that's not the sun. So we think the sun is, is going to be somewhere to the left uh, on this plot. Um, but the, one of the questions is how far left? And what you'll notice if you look at kind of panel B there, um, right up at the polar regions, uh, both in the north and the south, there's, there's a little bit of uh, speed up again. So you have a fast equator, slow mid latitudes. And then in this area where we can't really observe on the sun yet, um, it's possible there is this kind of coherent rapid vortex uh, at the poles. Or maybe not. If you move a little further left, like over in column A, 
um, this, this uh, polar vortex goes away. And that seems to be sort of associated with um, transitioning from this sort of solar-like state uh, to this, this state we call the antisolar uh, state where you've got a slow equator. Um, and so if we could observe uh, the pole, the polar regions of the sun, it may tell us something. Uh, the other big clue uh, that, that may help us understand where the sun lies on this, this sort of spectrum of behavior um, is the meridional flow. And so I'm showing um, on the, the lower uh, panel are meridional uh, streamlines of mass flux. So um, they're, they're telling you which way the, the mass is flowing um, in the uh, north, south, and uh, radial plane. So we've averaged these over, over longitude. And as you move to really low Rossby number regimes, uh, you tend to get meridional circulation that's very multicellular within a hemisphere. Um, but as you are sort of moving toward these transitional states and then ultimately to this, this other end of the, the spectrum, uh, you develop these big uh, single-celled flow profiles. Um, and so knowing something about the meridional circulation, its high latitude uh, structure, or particularly the, the high latitude structure of the differential rotation, uh, can in turn tell us something about the, the internal convective flow speed and structure uh, that we might expect in the sun. Um, and then because, because we don't know of this uh, kind of this fundamental property of the solar convection, we don't know, you know how fast is it and on what spatial scales is it actually acting. Um, there are really several different possibilities for uh, what the dynamo uh, may be doing. And maybe all of these are acting in tandem, you know, together, or maybe maybe just one of these is, is the um, kind of dominant mechanism acting within the sun, or maybe it's none of them. But, you know, we have this sort of classic picture of the, the interface dynamo, uh, which I'm, I'm showing here on the left. And the idea there is that the the convection generates all this sort of disorganized magnetic field um, in the convection zone, but it's acting to, to pump it down into the, the tachycline at the base, where you've got this really large scale, really organized shearing uh, going on, uh, where the, the differential rotation of the sun transitions to the solid body interior. And the idea is that there you can generate these big coherent toroidal magnetic fields that ultimately become buoyant and rise to the surface. And this interface dynamo may or may not act uh, in step with a, a flux transport mechanism where it's somehow the, the meridional flow is also working to, to move uh, emergent flux um, toward the polar regions and advect that back down uh, to the tachycline. Um, and of course, that depends somewhat, you know, whether this is actually happening in the sun depends somewhat on what the structure of the, the deep meridional flow is. And there's, there's still some questions about that. Um, but we also know that if you, if you operate one of these systems in a, in a pretty low Rossby number regime, uh, well, not, not really that low, uh, interestingly enough, uh, but, but low, so you're definitely on the, the left side of that, that spectrum. Uh, you can also generate, even without a tachycline, uh, you can generate these very large scale coherent uh, magnetic field, call these wreaths, these are... Uh, wreathy dynamos or magnetic wreaths, but this is kind of what I'm showing here. I'm showing an image from uh, Ben Brown's thesis work. Uh, he's a, also a professor at the University of Colorado. Uh, and we're, we're showing magnetic field lines in one of these simulations, and they're colored by whether they're running east or in the west direction, basically. Uh, and so there's some question, you know, what is going on inside the sun? And if we had a better handle on the, the convection and its structure and its speed, um, we could, we may be able to distinguish between these different possibilities or understand if they're even all acting uh, together on some level. Um, so if we look at the photosphere, uh, if we just look at the, the um, photospheric uh, convective spectrum, uh, just using uh, Doppler observations, oh, I'm sorry, I should have, this is, I lost the reference. Oh, there it is. There, yeah, sorry, this is some work done by David Hathaway and collaborators a few years ago. Um, and what you see, you see a couple of really prominent bumps. Don't worry about the different lines here, just the, the red, dark red line is fine. Um, so at a spherical harmonic degree of about a thousand, um, we see granulation. And so that's, that's really line of sight um, 
velocity kind of near disk center. The stuff, the stuff is basically radial and it's just sort of popping off uh, towards us all the time. But then as you move to the limb, you pick up a contribution from supergranulation. So this is, these are large um, collections of, you know, granules that are something like, you know, 10 to 30 granules across. Um, and they, this particular scale of convection overturns, uh, lives on a much more slowly, uh, lives on a longer time scale. And we tend to see it uh, near the limb because it's, it's actually overturning at the photosphere. And so it's really the horizontal bits we're able to detect most strongly and that's near the limb. Um, what we don't see is any convective power uh, on the, uh, or any significant convective power, I should say, on the scale that's commensurate with the depth of the, the convection zone. So spherical harmonic degree 10 to 20 is where we would expect to see um, motions that are kind of 200 megameters in size. And we don't see those. And that there's a, there's a big question, uh, why? Why don't we see those? And there's some different ideas about that. Um, I'll share one with you uh, that's one of my own, but there's, there's, there's lots of ideas about why we don't, why we don't see the convection there. Um, now we do see the supergranulation, uh, but we know that can't be the end of the story because it's acting, it's moving so rapidly and acting on such short time scales that it's firmly sits in the, the high Rossby number regime. And so whatever supergranulation is, um, it cannot be what's driving the solar differential rotation. We can try to go deeper using local helioseismology. So when we're looking at the big global modes, we can uh, measure, the, uh, measure the differential rotation very well. But for the convective flows and for the meridional circulation, which is not uh, symmetric across the equator, uh, we need to look at little patches of the sun. And while we can measure uh, using global modes, we can measure flows throughout the convection zone, well, the differential rotation anyway, we can't really do that with uh, local helioseismology. We can only kind of probe into the, the upper 15% or so of the convection zone. And so to get a sense of that, I'm, I'm showing uh, cuts through this differential rotation profile at different latitudes down here. This image comes from the uh, National Solar Observatory. And then what I did is I sort of colored this thing red um, in the region where we can observe flows. And so you can see flows in the kind of upper 30 to 40 megameters of the sun, but we can't go much deeper. Um, so, and we still don't really see the large scale convective uh, structure there, at least not conclusively. Um, things even get a little bit worse, uh, depending on what helioseismic technique you use, um, you can get different answers for the, the strength of, of the deep um, convective flows. And this is just showing some disagreement between a, a ring diagram analysis, uh, uh, measurement made by uh, Ben Greer, uh, who was a graduate student at CU uh, at the time, and uh, the time distance measurements of Shravan Hanasoge and his collaborators. And what we what we see is that these these two different measurements uh, disagree by by almost two orders of magnitude, depending on where you're where you're looking. Um, that's that disagreement has actually come ha has decreased a little bit in recent years, but I think they're still different by. 10, if I recall correctly. Um, it's not quite as dramatic as this, this plot, which is a little outdated. Um, the other lines you're seeing up at the top are from some convection models, uh, which seem to sort of suggest we should see power in the sun on those, those spatial scales. Um, but this is, this is really an active area of, of research right now. And so if you hear someone sort of talk about this convective conundrum, um, this is what they're saying. They're sort of saying, you know, where is the, the large scale power uh, in the sun's convective spectrum, right? Why don't we see uh, at the photosphere, why don't we see uh, motions on the kind of box scale, the 100 to 200 megameter scale? Um, how is it that if those motions really are so weak that we, we, we don't observe them, and it seems like we're not sure if we observe them deeper down, um, how do we even drive the, the differential rotation in the sun um, and also carry out the, the flux that we need to transport across the, the convection zone? Uh, so this is all sort of called the convective conundrum, if you hear someone talk about this, and it's, it's a pretty active um, area of research right now. Oh, just ignore that. Uh, so now kind of moving forward to what my group and I do, uh, well, we, we model uh, rotating convection. 
there's, there's different ways to do this in the sun, but what we do, uh, we model things in the, the analastic approximation. So you can think of this as it's effectively incompressible, uh, but you do retain the effects of background density stratification. Uh, and there are different non-dimensional control parameters, uh, but the, the important ones um, for the sun, uh, if you're trying to get a sense of how, uh, where you might want to be in modeling space is the, the Rayleigh number, which is giving you a sense of how, how hard the, um, the convection is driven thermally. Uh, the Prandtl number, which is giving you a sense of how long things take to diffuse viscously versus uh, thermally. And then this Ekman number, which is sort of telling you, uh, giving you a sense of the, the, the rate of viscous dissipation relative to the, to the rotation rate. Um, and so if you really want to model the, the solar convection zone, well, if you go just below the base of granulation, so you go like one, um, one megameter below the surface, and you want to model the rest of the convection zone from there down, you're looking at a, a 11 E foldings of the density. Um, you need to take into account radiative heating, which isn't that hard to do. Um, you want to cool uh, in the photosphere. You, if you really want to model that well, you need to, to incorporate radiative transfer into your code. You have rotation and magnetism, spherical geometry, all these things. But your your control parameters, your your Rayleigh number and your Prandtl number, these are actually very uh, extreme uh, values for these numbers, and it's very difficult to model. And so what you have to do, um, well, this just gives you a sense. So for every one viscous time scale, um, you're looking at 10 to the 15 rotation periods, for instance, um, or for every thermal time scale, you're looking at 10 to the seven convective overturnings. And so you have these, these huge disparities in time scales um, and also spatial scales that result as well that you would like to capture, and you just can't. Um, and so this is actually tough to model even badly, right? It's funny when you have something that's so complicated, it's tough to even do a bad job. Um, and so when, when we do a bad job, um, we can go up to maybe five density scale heights across the layer. Uh, some people have pushed to, to six or seven, um, at least in the, the formulation that we use. Uh, we tend to sort of parameterize the cooling um, at the surface. We, 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 we can't do the full convection zone and also radiative transfer. Um, though you may look at some of the recent work by, by Hideyuki Hota at Chiba University in Japan. He's, uh, he and his group are definitely pushing that way. And we have to, have to really restrict our, our non-dimensional numbers. Um, but this isn't, isn't actually as bad as it seems. You can still get um, pretty far with this approach. Um, I'll skip over this due to time. Uh, you can check this slide later, but just to get a sense of what we're actually doing when we, when we model things. Um, there's this, this uh, convection code that my group and I use, uh, as well as some of my other collaborators. Uh, it's, uh, its development was supported by the National Science Foundation through this um, computational initiative in geophysics. And uh, so if you're interested in it, um, come back to this recording and, and uh, follow the link here and you can, you can grab a copy from GitHub. Um, there's probably about 20 to 30 of us that are actively using this at any given time. Um, so what can, where can we get to with models? Well, um, we can actually go pretty far uh, in parameter space. So this is some work looking at non-rotating convection that I did with Brad Eyman a few years ago. And we're trying to get a sense of how the kinetic energy um, varied um, in these different systems as we change the, the thermal driving. And this, this parameter space study runs from things that you can do you know, on your local cluster. There's probably a few of these you could even do on your laptop, all the way up to things that we're using the big uh, Department of Energy machines uh, in the US. But what's interesting is you see, uh, as you increase the driving, things eventually latch on to this, this scaling law, which is very close to Rayleigh to the two thirds. Um, and what's interesting about that is that indicates that diffusion um, is no longer playing a leading order role in the dynamics. And that in this non-rotating case, the, the primary balance in the momentum equation is between inertia and uh, buoyant driving. So we call this a, a free fall scaling. Um, but what this, tells us, uh, though, is that um, virtually all of the energy, all of the potential energy in some downwind plume is actually going into motion, and it's not being uh, viscously dissipated um, in, a, in such a physically unrealistic fashion uh, that, the, um, 
that the model is just super laminar. And so um, when you when you run these sorts of models, if you run a big parameter space study, you can usually identify uh, scaling laws like this, and they kind of tell you that you're you're in a place that you know you're not in the stellar parameter regime, but you're in a place where you may be able to extrapolate results uh, to that to that parameter regime. Um, if we rotate these things, uh, you can get a sense of how they move. If this doesn't, oh good, it's not jerking around on me. Um, if this is coming through choppily, you can check out my uh, YouTube channel. There's some movies like this. There's some other movies of, of convection there as well. Um, but here you can see as you move from sort of non-rotating in the upper left uh, to uh, rapidly rotating in the lower right, the convection, um, what you're seeing is sort of convection surface of one of these simulations. And red flow is toward you and blue is, is downwelling flow. Uh, it becomes thinner. Uh, and you can also see some patterns in the convection uh, particularly uh, on these two panels in the lower right, uh, where the there looks almost like there's a wave moving through. So you see you modulation of the of the convective flow pattern. But we can we can take these these kind of extremes and and ask a question, right? So if we're non-rotating, we're, we're sort of amorphous in our convective patterns, uh, and if we're rotating, we have this this very organized structure, and we can look at the power spectrum of these things. And if I take the non-rotating, I just plot it in blue. Um, I have power all over the place. But if I take the, um, the rotating flows and I subtract out the contribution from the mean flows, which tends to make things look a little messier in the power spectrum because you have this symmetry uh, about the equator. But if I'm just looking at the convection, I see that it, it peaks at a much higher uh, degree of this place. It kind of peaks at a degree of uh, spherical harmonic degree of about 100. So that, that actually happens to be pretty close to the, to the scale of supergranulation. So there's some sort of uh, range of behavior from the left to the right here. And we can actually say, okay, let's measure the location of this peak in the spectra and, and try to understand now that we've added rotation, um, how this varies with one of our uh, control parameters. Uh, I lost my slide. Excuse me, uh, something out of order. I'm going to skip ahead for a second. Um, and so we, we can actually do that. Um, and we find that if we were to plot the location of the peak uh, with Rossby number, uh, we, we see that it latches onto the scaling where the, the peak scales as Rossby to the, to the minus one half. Um, and this is also one of these uh, diffusion-free uh, sorts of scaling laws this, that um, we've now struck kind of a triple balance between buoyancy, Coriolis, and inertia. Um, people in the fluids community call this uh, CIA balance. And again here, diffusion is active, but it's not, <clears throat> it's not playing a role in the leading order um, force balance. Um, and so, you know, one question is, can you do anything with this? Well, you can say, well, what if, what if the reason that we don't see large scale power uh, on the surface of the sun is that there actually isn't large scale uh, convection uh, due to the fact that the sun is operating in such a low Rossby number regime. Um, what if the convection is, is very small? And then how might we make sense of that? Well, we know we have these, these rapid near surface motions. We see this supergranulation. And if we were to combine that with some signature from the deep convection, we'd have what we have here kind of on the upper row. And I think this is what people have been looking for for a long time, which says, I should have some combined signature of the near surface stuff and the deep stuff, and I'll see the deep stuff at lower wave numbers, so larger spatial scales. So it's kind of the blue and the red combined there. Um, but if in fact that weren't true, if the deep stuff were very slow, and then it would also naturally be very small scale due to the Coriolis force, um, we might see a, a different sort of power spectrum at the surface. Um, and so one idea here is that you could, if this is what's going on, if in, uh, in effect, the deep convection is operating on a scale similar to or smaller than uh, surface supergranulation, you wouldn't see it. Um, and so you can sort of turn this idea around and say, okay, can I use the spatial scale of supergranulation to, to tell me something? about the, the deep convection. And so it might provide an implicit upper bound on the spatial scale of, of the deep convection. And so if you were to, then you can turn that around and say, okay, then what might suggest about the deep interior flow speed? And based on a plot like this, you can come out with something like 10 meters per second. Um, 
and this is just an idea, the simulations here, uh, the, 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 these are the results, but this idea uh, of maybe we have weak flow beneath uh, this rapid near surface flow uh, really is just an idea. It's a conjecture. And if it were true, this is, this is what you would come out with. Um, and so can we validate this at all? And so what I'll, I'll kind of go through here are a few things that our group is, is some of them we, we've, we've sort of just finished up, others we're starting to work on, um, but some, some future directions. And so the first thing is that we, um, Jeff Vassell uh, has done a lot of work uh, with, with Keith Julian and I, and uh, we tried to see if, uh, Jeff particularly, tried to see if he could um, come up with some theoretical description of what the, what the deep interior flow should look like if we account for the fact uh, that the Coriolis force should be doing something to the convection. And so the, the interesting thing is that uh, when flows move across the convection zone, um, they're, they're doing uh, work, uh, compression work due to the density stratification as they do so. Um, and so when you take that into account, you're, you're, you, know, you really need to account for PDV, uh, but your pressure P uh, acts differently depending on whether you're in a, a non-rotationally constrained regime or a regime where the Coriolis forces really matter. Um, and if you take this into account and you try to assume that the Coriolis forces don't matter, um, you can actually run into a contradiction. And so what you find is that uh, convection in something like the upper 50 megameters or so of the convection zone um, probably doesn't care about rotation. It's operating in a high Rossby number regime. Uh, but below that it does, and you actually come out with a, uh, uh, an estimated convective uh, spatial scale down there of around 30 megameters. And so um, there are, as you see, there are twiddles here. Um, one of the referees, uh, I think, complained a little bit about twiddle algebra, um, but, but still what we come up with is something that's uh, about a factor of 10 smaller than what people have been, have been looking for. So this is very interesting and we need to um, incorporate the, the effects of magnetism particularly uh, into this analysis now. Um, and this was just published in uh, PNAS and I said 2020 there, that's actually 2021, excuse me, this was published about uh, a month ago. Um, there's also a question, uh, what does is, what is overshooting uh, do? How does that impact the system? And so uh, Lydia Corre in our group um, has been working really hard to understand how the, the overshooting depth uh, scales depending on the degree of density stratification that you include in your model and the degree of rotational uh, constraint. And so uh, she has a paper, again, this should be 2021, this is under review now, um, and we're hoping to have this accepted uh, pretty soon. But the idea is that as you rotate uh, more and more rapidly or as your convection is slower, so as you move to a, a low Rossby number uh, regime, you, you find that your, your overshooting depth um, actually uh, decreases. Um, and then there's a bit more complicated behavior with the, the density stratification, which I won't get into here. Uh, the other thing is we're trying now to really map the available parameter space. And so uh, this is some, some nice work by Brad Heinemann that was published last year. So the 2020 is actually uh, correct here. Um, but we ran models with all different degrees of thermal forcing and all different degrees of rotation rates. Uh, so that we had, you know, strong thermal forcing, weak thermal forcing, strong rotational constraint, weak rotational constraint. Um, and what we found is that there's actually many different types of uh, convective morphologies that can occur. And I'm showing some here that are actually kind of laminar models just because they're easy to show on the slide altogether. But you have uh, things ranging from what we call equatorial columns to things that are basically columnar convection, but you've got kind of two different modes of it that are passing through each other. So it's modulated convection. Um, you can have these coherent cells that appear in the polar regions, uh, as well as uh, plumes, which so you don't have really coherent cells, but you just have plumes popping off all in the polar regions. And then you have this, this sort of anti-solar behavior. So everything on this, this uh, uh, phase space diagram that's not in the pink has a, has a fast equator, sort of like the sun. Um, and then poles that are slow or maybe not even differentially rotating very much at all. Uh, but in the pink region, this is this, this anti-solar state where you've got a slow equator and rapidly rotating poles. These are pretty laminar. We've got some movies online though, if you're, if you're interested, uh, there's a, a URL there. Um, this is one that's got a bit more uh, resolution. 
um, and we just let these evolve for a while. So what you're seeing, you're seeing um, near the surface of one of these models, you're seeing the, the upflows and the downflows rendered in red and blue. Um, and we're uh, evolving this for, for several rotation periods. Um, and you can kind of get a sense if you, when you're looking down from the pole, um, you see these, these structures that are, that are long lived. They seem to, to propagate um, around the poles with the, with the differential rotation. Uh, and so if we were to kind of look at the, the poles of the sun, the, the, the spatial scale size of the convection that we see there, um, where we're really feeling the, the vorticity of those underlying convective columns that may tell us uh, something about what's going on deeper. Um, here's another rendering, another movie where we, we've actually looked at the, the component of the vorticity vector that's aligned with the rotation axis. And so this is, um, this is the part of the convection that is really um, kind of telling you how, how rotationally influenced it is. Anyway, you can check these out on your own if you're interested. Um, but so, you know, the big thing, and I say this, this coming up, uh, you know, solar uh, orbiter is already well on its way. I, I know it's made a few uh, initial measurements as part of the commissioning phase, but I'm not quite sure when it will be taking data, but this, it's going to um, gradually uh, change its orbit so that it's out of the ecliptic and, and just managing to view over the polar regions of the sun. And so there's some question, is there anything interesting that we, we can see up there? Um, and I think the answer is, is yes. Um, and you might ask, well, why, why would we expect to see something different um, at the poles relative to the equator? And so if we're sort of looking uh, from the ecliptic at the sun, um, we can certainly measure horizontal flows in the near surface regions with, with helioseismology, but we, we're only able to, to image them down through the um, kind of 30, uh, upper 30 megameters of the convection zone. And so we're, we're getting a very incomplete picture of what might be a very strong uh, signal in the vorticity, uh, particularly the component of the vorticity that's uh, aligned with the, the rotation axis. Uh, whereas if we were to look at the, the polar region, uh, we would be viewing these structures from a very different angle. Uh, we would be able to see the, the entire uh, polar region. We'd be able to see kind of the entire vortex as opposed to some little bit of it um, that's moving left or right as we do in the equatorial plane. And then we, we aren't able to see it deeper down. Here we can see the, the full uh, vortical structure potentially. Uh, and there is some question, you know, is it interesting up there to see, would we see something like this? And, I would say there are some very strong suggestions that we already are. Um, this is done both through uh, local helioseismology. So it, what you're seeing here are two different uh, imaging techniques for flows. On the left, uh, measurements of surface flows using local helioseismology. And on the right, uh, measurements of surface flows using uh, by created by tracking supergranule scale features in the, in the Doppler spectrum. Oh. And both of these sets of measurements are subject to severe foreshortening. While it looks like you're looking down at the pole, you're not. These were made from the ecliptic. Um, and so things get pretty bad as you move toward the polar region. But when we look, uh, it does seem like we may be seeing uh, some uh, coherent vortical structures. It's pretty striking. If you uh, check out this paper, uh, from Hathaway and Upton in uh, 2020, it was just published last year. There are some accompanying movies, and I should have I should have shown one here. I'm sorry about that, uh, but you can see these uh, the structures sort of near the equator uh, on the right. They they kind of move at random and look a little strange, but the structures near the poles actually propagate um, in a very ordered fashion. Um, and so I think this really motivates uh, the need for missions like uh, Solar Orbiter or even more. Uh, maybe ambitious missions to view the sun from an even uh, higher angle. Um, and that's kind of what I'll close with here. I'll just give you a, a heads up about something that will hopefully be coming down the, the pipeline. But there's this uh, mission that's now in a, uh, completing its phase A concept study. This is the uh, Solaris uh, mission, which is one of five that was selected for a phase A uh, middle class explorer study by, uh, by NASA. Um, and the idea is that we'll use uh, 
Jupiter. So we'll send uh, this, this little space probe out to Jupiter and use Jupiter as kind of a gravity assist. We'll, we'll get into an orbit that's sort of passing over Jupiter's poles and then rocket off and go over the poles of the sun uh, that way. And the, the primary mission is to make one pass around the sun. So we'll have 100 days uh, over each pole. Um, and then here's just kind of a graphic that, that shows this. Um, so the idea is you'll, we'll, we'll head out to Jupiter pass under the southern pole of the sun for 100, 108 days, uh, and then over the, over the northern pole. Um, and depending on the measurement you make, you'll have a pretty good view of the polar regions for, I'd say, anywhere from, from 90 to, to 100 uh, days, at least from the helioseismology uh, standpoint. Um, all of this is still very far out. We won't know until the spring uh, if this is selected. They're, they've selected five for the, the phase A, and they'll down select to one or maybe two. Um, and then this will launch, uh, if, if selected, about five or six years from now, and it'll be around 2030 uh, when it actually starts taking measurements. Uh, so, and even if this doesn't go, something like this will probably um, head out, I suspect, in the next uh, 15 or 20 years. This has been kind of identified in various uh, areas as a, as a community-wide priority. Um, but keep an eye out. Maybe maybe you'll hear about Solaris in the spring. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll I'll take uh, any questions. Nick, thank you very much. It was really a nice talk, no, and a very thank interesting you. subject. No, Nick, we invited uh, Maria Virginia, who is a colleague from our division, to manage the Q Q and A. Is a specialized in plasma physics and also medical simulation. Okay. Virginia? Yes. Okay, good morning. I'm sorry, I was a little bit late. I lost just a few minutes of our presentation. Very nice. I learned a lot of things, many, many things very new to me. And I noticed there is no questions in the chat. Usually, People write their questions along the talks, and I could not see any questions in the chat. So if you have a question, please open your microphone and ask yourself. I do see that Robert Cameron has his hand raised. I have a question. Oh, yeah. I, sorry, okay, I, I, please. I have, a question. I have two questions. So, so the first is we at high latitudes. For example, um, we can observe the velocity, we can observe the vorticity, we observe um, this high latitude mode with most of its power, say above 60 degrees. And I suspect, this is, so what would you expect to see and why aren't we seeing it already? Can you clarify what you mean by we see a high latitude mode? above 60 or 70 degrees. So half a wave, for example, has observed this M is equal to one mode. Oh, we this, have a yes. recent paper on it. Um, and, but you can also see small scale magnetic features all the way up to the pole when the viewing angle is good. So what exactly scales do you expect us to see and why haven't we seen it? Yeah, okay, so that's, that's a good question. And the first is I would say, I'm not sure uh, what we would expect to see. I, what I do think um, there's the, the two sets of measurements that I showed there um, are showing, uh, for instance, the, the Hathaway and Upton measurements are showing structures that are sort of on the scale of 100 megameters, but that also has to do with their, their averaging window. And so they're, they're resolution limited. In, in that uh, this is, this is, so there's a recent paper by Gisson et al. 2021, where they explained that this is a um, basically a bioclinic mode. The, uh, the small scale structures as well? No, the M is equal to one structure, this large mode they're seeing. And there's a whole bunch of inertial modes which are detected and characterized in addition to the RASP mode um, in that paper. So, so we do see structure at high latitudes. We see structure at mid latitudes. Um, and we can see with Hinode um, small scale magnetic fields all the way up to the pole and even beyond when the B angle is good. So what exactly? Yeah, so I think, I think the, the hope would be, um, so if I were looking for convective features up there, I would be looking for something that's, that lives for, 
for many different, uh, several rotation periods. Um, it's possible, I mean, you always have to acknowledge, you may see nothing. Um, but if you're going to see the, uh, some sort of uh, vortical structure that's, that's aligned uh, with the rotation axis, that's the place to look for it, particularly with local helioseismology, which is, um, you, well, you, you can observe vertical, uh, vertical flows, um, the, the surface motions are, are definitely the, the, the easiest to detect. But I don't know. I mean, it's, it is, it's always possible you, you won't see anything, but that tells you something. Um, it, it probably raises more questions, right? Where is the, the giant cell power? Um, it's possible we'll see some kind of uh, coherent motion of structures. Uh, why we haven't seen those in the magnetic features, I, I, don't, I don't know. Now, I was talking more about the velocity features, and I would have expected to have seen an Ekman boundary layer um, connecting the horizontal components of the flow um, to fix this visibility problem at mid latitudes. But you're not expecting that to see those? I'm, I'm not clear what the structure of the boundary layer should be, right? When I think of an, an Ekman boundary layer, my intuition really comes from things that have a, a rigid upper boundary. Um, you're, you're operating with your typical no slip or stress-free conditions. Um, I, I don't have a good sense of what that should look like in the sun, right? When you, you've got um, photospheric granulation popping off, um, what is what is super granulation? I, I don't know. I, I, I just don't have a good answer to that question. Okay, and my second question is, concerning the magnetic field. So essentially the small scale dynamo is a bifurcation, which is sitting just outside the parameters, I guess you've been studying so far. So how does, how robust do you think your results about the convection are given this bifurcation occurs just beyond the parameters you're currently at? Yeah, I think, I think how uh, magnetism plays into uh, the, the convective structure is, is, a, is a really good question. And the first thing I'll do is say, um, you know, there's some recent work by uh, Hideyuki Hota and uh, collaborators, uh, it's just published in Nature, um, I think even the other day. Um, and they, they sort of argue that the, the small scale magnetism really works to suppress flows on the, on the larger scales to suppress the, um, the power of those. Um, and it helps with some other issues, whereas you try to push to more solar-like uh, parameter regimes, um, you know, you tend to run into this anti-solar behavior because you're ultimately sort of driving the system harder and harder. Um, I have done uh, some uh, work uh, in the past year, and we're, we're trying to kind of get this together into a paper now where we ran magnetic analogs to um, some of these models that I showed. And we looked actually at the spectrum of the uh, convection and said, you know, where, where is the peak? Um, does it change? And it doesn't seem to move things around uh, very much. But of course, when you, when you run a dynamo, um, you know, as you say, we're sort of sitting in parameter space in, in, a, in a place where maybe we're, we're not, you know, maybe we're still a little too, too laminar or something. We're not activating a, a small scale dynamo. Um, but if you take, take some of these models that are on uh, this sort of uh, CIA balance curve, add magnetism to them, uh, the convective spectrum doesn't seem to change that much, uh, but this is still still a very initial study. I showed some of this at, at AGU last year. I didn't include it in this talk because it's not that not that interesting. Okay, thank you. Nice talk. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have here in the chat one question. It's maybe a very very basic question, and I don't know. Uh, the name of the person who asks this is please watch it or Jara. Do we want to do your question by yourself or do you want me to read your question? I cannot see here. here. So he says, he asks a very, very basic questions and is the following. Uh, for generation of magnetic field, we need time variation of electric field. So the electric field is generated by the charge separation below convection zone. So it, this is very basic in, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's more like you have electric fields everywhere. So the, 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 you've got uh, your, 
you have a plasma, right? So, and once you get into the, the bulk of the convection zone, it's, it's pretty much fully ionized, right? So you've got electrons and protons moving about um, everywhere. And this, this is all really, um, it, currents are everywhere, I think is the easiest way to answer that. It's not that there's a charge separation at the, at the base of the convection zone. Um, and this is actually captured in the MHD uh, equations, but you don't see it written as, as an electric field. It's, it's um, written instead as a, um, the uh, electromotive term uh, V cross B. Uh, but but the, the, I think the, the shortest answer is the currents are everywhere. Um, not just, it's not due to some uh, charge separation across the region or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? May I ask a question, Virginia? Sure, sure. So, uh, Nick, uh, I find your uh, slide 37 very interesting. You, you know, the, the total energy is conserv conserved only if the net flux through the inner and, and outer boundaries of the, your domain uh, have a, a equal flux, no? So, otherwise, you may not have a conservation there. Which, uh, in your simulations, what is the net energy transport in to or out the convection zone? Have you checked it? Yeah, so uh, what we do is we, we model the, the radiative heating. Um, you can do, are you talking, first to make sure, are you you're talking about the thermal energy? Yes, yeah, the thermal energy. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so while we, we can't, in these sorts of models, we can't capture the photosphere um, very well. Uh, we we can capture the radiative heating um, just fine. That's a in the sun. While you, you know we tend to write that as a, as a, a diffusion operator on the, the background temperature. Um, from this in these models, we treat the the background temperature as fixed. Right, the convection is occurring on a very short time scale, and so what you have essentially is this big volumetric heating function that's more or less proportional to the background pressure. Um, if you if you go through you know model s grab all the parameters and say what does the heating actually look like you get this complicated expression for it but it's not that dissimilar from just being proportional to the background pressure um, and so this is dumping you know uh, a, a solar uh, luminosity worth of heat into the uh, into the system every second uh, but then to get it out through the surface we actually take things out through conduction through thermal conduction um, operating on the on the the, the temperature or entropy variations uh, associated with the convection, and so you build up a, a boundary layer that uh, really looks a lot like a, a classical uh, Rayleigh Bernard uh, system. You know where your 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 adiabatic. So if you look at your entropy gradient, it's pretty flat in the interior. Uh, your, where your entropy profile is flat, your gradient is zero, and then near the boundaries, it uh, tapers off very rapidly. And and the the thinness of that boundary layer and the steepness is what um, that responds to the heat you're dumping in um, so that so that things go out the top. So yeah, it, it's, energy is definitely conserved um, in, in these. Uh, we, we put energy in and it's taken out. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm asking because, you know, in your slide, you put a, you, you mentioned a 30 megameters region near the surface, no, that may be a, operating uh, is slightly different regime, no? And they, we know that the, these bright and dark structures at the solar surface, they modulate the, the radiative uh, output, no? So we, may we expect uh, some changes in the solar luminosity in the, during the solar cycle? If, if it happens, what is the effect in the convection zone in these 30 megameters? Region. Yeah, I, I suppose it would depend on how much it was changing. Um, I mean, it's it's interesting from kind of a different angle, um, which is that when you look at these these sorts of systems that are uh, rot rotating uh, rapidly enough or convecting slowly enough so that you have a, a solar like equator, um, they tend the convection actually wants to 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 shoot more energy out. The poles um, it transports energy better parallel to the rotation axis than it does um, at the equator, and so these the, this they tend to um, have. Uh, I think if you were to take the differential rotation you see in the sun and make 
kind of a few assumptions, you come out with something that's that you would expect to see maybe a 10 to 12 Kelvin difference between equator and pole. Um, and we don't see that. So that's, that's a big puzzle. And so, uh, you know, is that telling us that we, we really don't understand what the convection is doing down there or are these, these near surface um, layers doing, doing something to kind of scramble uh, that, uh, that asymmetry that would be there otherwise in terms of the, uh, the heat transport or the, you know, the surface luminosity. Um, but so the, the question I, I would have then would be to say, because I haven't really thought about this, but you know, over the course of the solar cycle, um, how much does the effective temperature vary? Um, you know, if the if the luminosity of the sun is changing um, a little bit, and, and is it is that is that just is the other thing is that really reflective on average of everywhere, or is this just due to uh, you yeah, know, more sunspots across the disk? Yeah. Because we um, observe the the irradiance just from the eclipse plane, also, no? we don't know exactly how it changed in latitude. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to compute this, but uh, it's, a, of course, a very small variation through the sun. I'm, I, I'm wondering not just through one cycle, but uh, in long-term scales, no? If you just get uh, uh, removing the, the energy from this region, uh, somehow it's going to change the properties of the convection, no? Yeah, At least in years near surface. That's right. If you're cooling less than you're driving more weakly, right? Um, versus if you're, if you're cooling more, you're gonna drive uh, more strongly. And so it should push you around on that spectrum a little bit. But I, my suspicion- I, I, thought the, I thought the storage time of the convection zone was 100,000 years. So all this on solar cycle time scales is negligible. I saw Sir Hank Sprout dealt with that in the- Yeah, I think, I, I think that's, that's also probably a good point. Um, any any small changes you make at the surface, it's gonna, it's kind of like the tail trying to wag the dog, right? Um, and and, and, so, and uh, what you do drive uh, intermediate inflows into the active regions, but um, beyond this, I don't. I, I, so I think the radiance changes you see have no significant impact on the on the structure. Yeah, you you would have to really change the. The boundary layer properties, I would say, uh, on a large scale, in order to to affect it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree with what Robert's saying. Luis, uh, can we have one more question? Because Alison will raise his hands, and I don't know. Do you still want to to, to make a question, Alison? Yes, yes, I do. Yes, um, please. Uh, th thanks for the very interesting talk. I I, I have a question. I don't know if it makes sense, but I, if I understood well, you had two scenarios of uh, convection zone, one extreme non-rotating and one rotating. So I was wondering how would that affect the activity cycle length of this? Uh, or, or does it affect or not? Yeah, yeah. So, so actually this is, um, if, what, I, what I would suggest is have a, uh, do a search on the rotation activity correlation. Um, and so generally, as you rotate more and more rapidly for, you know, some given class of star, uh, the, the activity level uh, picks up um, quite a bit, up to some layer, and then it saturates for reasons that aren't entirely clear. I think um, some, uh, some thoughts are that it's you've effectively just covered the star with so many star spots that there, <laughs> there can't be any more um, spots to host activity. Uh, but there's there's some pretty clear uh, relations between um, activity and rotation rate. And then is your um, the other thing if you want to get a sense for how the the period is related. Um, I'm trying to think, there's a paper by uh, Bohm uh, Vitense from well several years ago now, um, but they take kind of solar-like stars um, and they ask you know how do the how does the period of the activity vary with the uh, rotation rate of the star and the period I believe goes down in general um, as the rotation rate goes up uh, but I may be remembering this wrong but what's interesting too is that some of these stars actually seem to show two different branches of activity um, so kind of two different cycles acting acting as, as one but in general as you rotate more rapidly you have more more activity thank you Okay, 
Oh, there is another question here in the chat. Uh, maybe this is the last one. Consider the time, right, Luis? Yes, yes. Yes. It depends on the niche. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the, uh, I see it now. Does the convection? Convection. Well, yes, you can read it. It's have easier it, for you. It, yeah. Have any impact on other celestial bodies since it's associated with magnetic fields? And I, I would say. Uh, no, except to the extent that the sun's magnetic field um, impacts the, the solar wind. Um, but I, I don't think there's any reason to think that, um, it, well, I mean, and of course the solar wind hits the earth's magnetic field. These things are all linked, but I, I don't think a, a dynamo in one object, for instance, is responding to a, a dynamo in another object in the solar system. Okay, thank you, Luis. If you want to, oh, another yeah, yeah. one, <laughs> another question. Can we stop or, I don't know, it depends on, on the, our invited. Oh, I'm, I'm fine to, to sit for a few minutes. Uh, yes, there is another one. And, and I have no idea how to answer that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what, what is responsible for the inconsistent peak we're experiencing in the solar cycle? I, I don't know. Okay. So, uh, we also would you like to, to post the, the similar? Yeah, I'll be glad. So, um, uh, so on behalf of EMPI, uh, I'm I'm the head of the the heliophysics, planetary science, and aeronomy division here at our institute. So, I would like on behalf of, of our institute to thank you for this very interesting presentation. Um, it was very didactic, I must say, and uh, I'm sure our students learned a lot today, and, and also we did learn a lot today. So thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank I would you like for the to, opportunity to speak. I'd like to, I'd like to thank the audience also uh, for staying with us and uh, asking questions and uh, participating. Uh, we always have these seminars, um, try to have once a week. Exceptionally, this week we have two. Tomorrow we have another one and uh, on space weather. And uh, you are all invited by Jim Span from uh, NASA. So thank you very much again and see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much.